evening. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me, Bill? Okay. All right. Good, good, good. Okay. Everybody's asking, what song are we doing tonight? What song are we doing tonight? People asked me last night, and I was like, mm, okay, I'll tell you. So Psalm 51. Somebody said that it was like, that's like Area 51. No. <laughs> Psalm 51. And just a little commercial maybe before, while you're turning there. Um, um, we started promoting last Sunday our next Beyond Sunday Community Service Project. Uh, serve our seniors, and we're going to send teams out uh, to our local assisted living communities and our convalescent home. And basically, we're going to bring like a party to these folks. And kind of, it's called, the theme is celebrate the good old days. And we're going to encourage them to bring out some of their memorabilia. And we're going to bring some ourselves and have decorations and crafts and games and refreshments. And the whole idea is just a great opportunity for us to kind of get outside the four walls of the church, get into our community, meet some people. These are people that are either older or they have big health issues. Love on them. Show the love of Jesus to them in a practical way. Create opportunities to share the gospel. Tell people about the Lord. And so just want to invite you, if that tugs in your heart at all, sign up. We'd love to have you be a part of it. We're doing all the sign-ups electronically. You can do it with your smartphone. Go to the Calvary Nexus app. There's a tab on the Calvary Nexus app. Go to the Calvary Nexus website calvarynexus.org, go to the Beyond Sunday website, beyondsunday.com, any one of those. We'd love to have you be a part of that. We've done it before. It's been a couple of years. It's time to do it again, and God always blesses it, and neat things happen. So there's the commercial. Are you guys at Area 51 yet? Just checking to make sure you're listening. So I want to start off tonight and um, ask you a couple of questions. And if you want to, maybe let's, let's raise hands. How many of you have ever done or said anything that you've regretted or been embarrassed about or felt guilty about. Wow, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, I envy you. <laughs> okay, let's switch it up a little bit. How many of you have ever, and us, how many of us have ever done anything that we know was displeasing to the Lord? Appreciate your honesty. How many of us here perhaps still struggle with feeling some guilt or shame or regret, I'm not done yet, about some of the things that we've done in the past. Anybody still? Okay, it's not just me. That's a good feeling. Thank you. You know? I mean, I can definitely look back through my life, and I was thinking about it today. It really kind of started in high school. <laughs> was it, my list starts there. But pretty much through different sections of my life, different periods, I can just remember certain things that I'm not telling you about, <laughs> you know, that I feel guilty about or that I'm ashamed of or that I still have regrets about. You know, and I've been a Christian a long time and I, I've confessed to the Lord and I understand that he forgives me and yet on some levels, and, and I, maybe you can relate to this, on some levels I still have, uh, you know, guilt and and shame and, and stuff like that. So what are, what are we supposed to do with our sin? You know, what are we supposed to do with it? What are we supposed to do with these residual feelings of guilt and shame? Is there some way that we can be released from them? And, and if so, how? Well, I believe we're going to get some answers to some of those questions tonight as we go through Psalm 51. It's written by King David, and remember, he was a man after God's own heart, right? And he wrote this psalm, and, and as we study it and we kind of move through the process of it, I, I think we can get a better understanding of how we can deal with our own sin, how we can process and be set free from that guilt and that shame that maybe some of us are still holding on to. And so our subject tonight is David's prayer of repentance. David's prayer of repentance and our objective is that we would repent, be restored, and rejoice. And I hope you pretty appreciate the alliteration, because I know Pastor Bruce does. <laughs> um, and you know what, I'd just like to invite you, would you pray with me right now, and let's just ask our Lord to speak to us tonight. Lord, we just praise you for who you are. Thank you so much for so many things. And tonight, Lord, I just ask for each of us that you'd speak to us, give us ears to hear, Lord, and hearts to respond in faith, and particularly, Lord, as we wrestle with this 
subject of our sin and guilt and repentance and restoration and, and just what to do with all that. We, we want to be right with you, Lord, and we know we can be, and sometimes in our humanity and our sin, it's hard for us to understand it all. It's hard for us to believe it all. It's hard for us to apply it all. And so I just ask that through your spirit tonight, you would help us to learn and to grow, to mature in these areas. And I ask this to your glory and in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So just a quick context. Psalm 51. By the way, I got a kudos to you guys who sent in the psalm request because you're just nailing a lot of the really good ones, I think. They're all good, but some are really special. Psalm 51 is one of seven what they call penitential psalms, psalms of repentance, of confession and brokenness. And as I mentioned, it was written by King David. And I just want to share with you 1 Kings 15.5. This is what is said about King David. David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. It's amazing that Scripture says that. And so we got to look at this except because this exception here is what caused this Psalm 51 to be written. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to remind us all of this story. You remember David committed adultery with Bathsheba, right? Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And Bathsheba got pregnant. And David, trying to conceal this whole mess, called Uriah back from the front lines of the war they were in, encouraged him to spend time with his wife, thinking if they hang out together, then everybody can think it's his baby. But Uriah was such a noble guy he said, I can't go and spend time with my wife and be comfortable when my brothers are out fighting. And so he wouldn't do it. So David, in his desperation to cover up his sin, essentially murdered Uriah. He set it up with his commander. He told his commander, send Uriah out in the heat of the battle where it's really nasty fighting and then pull away and leave him and let him get killed. So David had Uriah murdered. A while later, God sends Nathan the prophet to David. And Nathan the prophet tells David this story, and I want to share it with you because I just think it's a cool story, and it's kind of profound. Nathan the prophet tells David there were two men. There was this really, really rich guy that had flocks and herds, just an abundance. And then there's this other guy that had one little, tiny, little lamb. And he loved this lamb. He cared for it. He fed it. He treated it like a daughter. And Nathan tells David, one day a stranger came to the rich man's house. And remember, in this culture, hospitality is a huge issue. So the rich man was obligated to provide a meal for this stranger. But the rich man didn't want to take from all his flocks and herds that he had in abundance. The rich man instead goes and he steals. He takes the one little lamb this guy has, the only one. And he slaughters this lamb and he feeds it to the stranger. Now, when King David hears Nathan get to this point in the story, he gets upset. And essentially, he says, on my life, the man who did this is going to die and pay back everything many times over. You are the man. And right then, something happened and David's denial of his sin just broke down and he got convicted. And he was broken, and then through Nathan, God pronounced judgment, some serious consequences on David. And David was broken. And it's out of that brokenness and that conviction of his sin that David writes Psalm 51. So that's what we're looking at tonight. So let's work through this together. We're going to break it up into three sections. Repentance, restoration, restoration and rejoicing. And the first section is repentance. And as we read these six verses, I just want to, us to note the gravity of our sin. So let's look at Psalm 51, verses 1 to 6. David writes, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. 
Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Let's just stop right there. Let's take a look at David's repentance. The first thing we do, the first thing he does, have mercy on me, O God. David immediately starts crying out to God for mercy. And just to make sure we understand, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is receiving what you don't deserve. So David knows what he deserves. And he starts out his prayer here saying, God, have mercy on me. Don't give me what I deserve. He says, blot out my transgressions. Wipe out my sin. Take them away. I mean, you can just sense already David's misery, his unhappiness, this heaviness on him. And this is something that happens when we sin. It steals our joy. And I want us to just brainstorm for a minute because I think this will be helpful. How does sin in our lives steal our joy? What do you think? Yes, Josie. Guilt. Yes, it brings guilt upon us. Yeah, Bill. <laughs> yeah, you can spend a lot of time and energy trying to hide it. That's insightful. Yes, Linda. It, it opens up opportunities then for the evil one to come in and attack us even more. Yes, John. Oh, you start withdrawing. Yes. I see that a lot in counseling. People start withdrawing from other people, the opposite of what we need to do. Is that Harold back there? And it makes us feel inadequate. Yes. Yes, Richard. Hmm. You know what? Sometimes God allows us to experience the consequences of our sin. That can be not very joyful. Yes? Oh, that's a good one too, Deontay. It takes our eyes off of God. Suddenly we're focused on ourselves and our sin and hiding and covering up. Yeah. Yes, it robs us of our self-esteem, our identity, our confidence in our relationship with God. It can undermine and steal that. Good insight. Anybody else? I think we could go on for a while, but I think the yeah, you got one? All that. That's very profound, Roland. It misdirects our energy and we start trying to save ourselves or make ourselves better or make ourselves feel better instead of allowing God to work. Yes? Yeah, yeah. It can, it, should, it can be like a domino effect. It can start building in our lives. Yeah, it's good. Yes, one more. It blinds us and makes us believe that sin is actually joy. That's profound too. We can actually learn to substitute the true joy of God and find this temporary pseudo joy in our sin. All right. The point I want us to realize, sin is a big deal. It matters because we're disobeying our holy God. It steals all these things that we've just talked about and more and, and worst of all, it gets in the way of our fellowship, our relationship with God. It's a big deal. So David is here asking the Lord for mercy about his sin. Not because he deserves it. You notice what he says. He says, because of your righteousness, because of your loving kindness, because of your tender mercies. He's appealing to God based on his character, not on anything that's of him. And that's true with us too. We can never deserve God's forgiveness. None of us. We ask for it because of his mercy and by his grace he gives it to us. And David recognized that. And we see here that he's, he's praying, wash me thoroughly. Cleanse me. He's, he's feeling guilty like we talked about. He's feeling dirty. I read a quote, what dirt is to the body, sin is to the soul or the spirit. Isn't that good? 
He's got this stain, this crud, this gunk on his soul that he's allowed to stay there and fester. And the beautiful thing is he's feeling conviction. This whole section is about conviction. This guilt is conviction, and conviction is a good thing. Conviction means the Holy Spirit is working in him, convicting him of his sin, letting him know there's something wrong. We don't like it, but sometimes it's the, mo- the thing we need most, that conviction, that guilt, because that's God working in us, hoping that as we're convicted of our sin, what we'll do is turn to him in repentance and be restored with him again. We shouldn't ignore it, you guys. If you're feeling a, a conviction, that guilt in your heart. Now, there can be fake guilt. We have our own guilt. And sometimes it's hard to discern between the two, and we need to talk to God about that. But if there's something going on in your heart, you're feeling a conviction of, you need to address that. More than likely, that's the Holy Spirit. That's one of his jobs, is to convict us of our sin. And you need to take a time on and say, Lord... Is this wrong? Am I doing something wrong? Show me what's wrong. You need to get right with them about that. Don't ignore it. And that leads to the next part of this confession. After there's conviction of sin, the healthy response, the right response, the godly response is confession. David says, verse 3, I acknowledge my transgressions. David admitted his sin. Another psalm that he penned around this same time regarding the same incident is Psalm 32. You don't have to turn there. We don't have time to go through it, but I'm going to pull a couple verses from that too. Psalm 32 and verse 5, David writes, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. When we feel conviction of sin, we need to confess it. To whom? Well, in some Some circles, people believe that we have to confess it to a priest or some kind of intermediary. But that's not what the Bible says. Should we confess it to one another? Yeah, James talks about that. We should confess our sins to one another so that we can pray for each other and be healed, right? Should we confess our sin maybe to the person that we sinned against and ask for forgiveness? Yes, that's a good thing too. But ultimately, The one to whom we most importantly need to confess our sin to is the one to whom we've sinned against, and that is God, right? It is God. David says, against you and you only I have sinned. That doesn't mean he didn't sin against Bathsheba, Uriah, and a whole bunch of other people. But ultimately, David understood that all sin is against God. Bottom line, most importantly. And that's that's why we have to confess to him. Sin is not about doing what people think is wrong. Sin is not about doing what we think is wrong. Sin is about doing what God says is wrong. He's God. He decides. <laughs> right? He makes the rules because he knows what's best because he's our creator. It's about his. And then he says, you know, you've been found just. You are just. Where is that? Oh, you, you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. In other words, David's saying, I'm guilty and you can, you can judge me and condemn me and you are absolutely right. I have no argument. I am guilty. David understands and recognizes his sinfulness. Sometimes it's hard to do as proud people. We want to make excuses. We want to rationalize. We want to blame other people. But we need to do what David does here and say, you know what, I'm guilty, God. You got me. I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to defend myself. I'm guilty. And then he takes it a step further. And we look in verse 5 and he says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in, my, in, in sin my mother conceived me. That doesn't mean he was illegitimate. What he's talking about is that he has a sinful nature, as we all do. We're all born into this world as sinners. Did you know that? It's kind of a bummer. We didn't have a choice, but we're all in the same boat. We're not only sinners by choice, we're sinners by nature. We cannot help ourselves apart from the grace of God. And then David says, you desire truth in the inward parts. For almost nine to 12 months, David had not dealt with this. 
until God sent Nathan to him with this story. So David had been either denying it, suppressing it, pretending it didn't happen, rationalizing, whatever he did. And he's recognizing now God's not going to let him get away with this. God wants truth and integrity deep down in our inward parts. God loves us too much to let us keep that unconfessed, unrepented sin in our hearts and our lives. He loves us enough to convict us of it. He loves us enough sometimes to allow us to experience the consequences of it to bring us to a place of conviction and repentance. And David recognized that. There's no hiding from God on this. He already knows it anyway, right? Do you guys know that? He already knows it anyway. It's just about us. We're so prideful and broken sometimes, we can pretend and fool ourselves. That's why Jeremiah wrote about the wickedness and deceitfulness of the heart. God wants us to be completely honest with him and have that clear relationship with him because he's working in us, you know? He's making us more like his son Jesus. That's the sanctification process that we're all in while we're walking this planet, right? So there's no cleansing without the confession. And confessing without repentance is really inauthentic and ineffective. You can say, oh yeah, I did that wrong, yeah, that was wrong to do, but if there's no sorrow, there's no mourning, there's no grief, there's no conviction about it, that's not true repentance. And there will be no true forgiveness. And so we see in this first part just our our sin. We're all sinners and this sin is bad. It offends a holy God, our creator, and it separates us from him. But God in his grace allows us to feel convicted about it, to feel guilty about it. And then when we sin, we know we need to confess it and be real with him about it and repent of it, change directions, want to be different. And then when we do that, we can move on to this next phase, so to speak, this next step That's restoration, restoration. And we're going to read the next few verses, and I want us to note just the graciousness of the forgiveness of God. Look with me at verse 7. David writes, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, restore me to the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Let's just stop right there. And the first step we see in this restoration is this cleansing. David talks about being purged or cleansed with hyssop. And hyssop is an interesting uh, plant. You see it mentioned several times in the Bible. Remember in Exodus, when the angel of death was going to come over Egypt and slay all the firstborn, God told the Israelites to, to spatter blood on their, on their doorposts, around their doors, and they were supposed to use a branch of hyssop to do that. So it's associated with with cleansing and and sacrifice. The Levitical priest used hyssop. They dipped it in water or blood in many kinds of ceremonial rituals, cleansing, purification. And then I thought this was interesting. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and he said he was thirsty and they dipped something in some vinegar and, and, and held it up to his mouth, they used a branch of hyssop to do that. But all through scriptures, hyssop is associated with this idea of cleansing and purifying. And that's why David's using it here as a, as a metaphor. You, you know, cleanse me with this hyssop and I shall be clean. And then he says, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And you realize David's asking God to do the cleansing. He's asking God to do the washing. We can't wash ourselves. We can get ourselves dirty We can acknowledge that we're filthy. And we can can try to clean ourselves, but we can't do it. 
It's something only God can do. And the only thing that really makes us clean is the blood. We we sang about it tonight. When we sang that song, I thought that was so cool. What can wash as pure as snow? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Remember we sang that? It's true. (laughs) Only by faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, the blood that he shed for you and for me, that's how we're made clean. We can never make ourselves clean. We need him. It's amazing that he's willing to cleanse us he doesn't have to and because we're pretty dirty but he does and he cleanses us completely this is something we need to grasp from tonight if you're washed in the blood of the lamb so to speak you're clean completely I was thinking you know what I think that bugs me at my house we have a kind of a cheap dishwasher I should get a new one I don't know why I don't But who wants to spend money on a dishwasher, right? We've got this cheap dishwasher, so I'll run the dishes, and inevitably I'll open up, start putting dishes away, and what happens? I pull out a dish, and there's crud on it. Have you been there? Drives me crazy, so i got to go scrub it off and put it in and run it through again. We are not like those dishes. We're clean. Once for all. Now, we sin periodically, and so... God's put this thing together where we can confess, repent, and be cleansed again. But ultimately, as Jesus told Peter while washing the disciples' feet, we are clean because of our faith in Christ. And we need to remember that. Some of that guilt that we're experiencing and the the shame that we're experiencing from stuff gone by is because we don't truly believe that we're totally clean. We think there's a little crud left over. But that blood of Jesus is pretty powerful stuff the ultimate cleanser. It says, I shall be whiter than snow. And snow in Scripture is used just as a symbol of total purity, ultimate cleanness. You see some descriptions of the Lord Jesus himself as like his face was as white as snow or his garments were as white as snow. That's as pure as it can get. That's what David's asking God to do. Make me that pure and that clean. And through Christ, we can be that. And only through him. I love how Isaiah was inspired to write in Isaiah 118. God says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, blood red, they shall be as white as snow. I love that because it it depicts how awful our sin is and yet how pure we can be made through Christ. So let's brainstorm again, can we, for a second? We understand this. Why do people tend to still hold on to their guilt even after they've confessed their sin to God? What do you think? Help me out on this. Yes. Oh, that's a good one. They don't believe they're deserving. And guess what? They're not. You're not. I'm not. That's not the point, right? Ron. Ah, you know what? It's a good point. We have a spiritual enemy. One of his titles is accuser. Good point. Yes. Okay, that's interesting. Maybe the Lord is prompting us to do some reparation, some of that confessing to the one that we've hurt or sinned against. Yeah, sometimes maybe just saying, I'm sorry, God, please forgive me, is not enough. Maybe God wants you to go. That's part of your growth and maturity. That's part of the other person's healing. That's a good point. Yeah. Yes, John. Okay. Sometimes we're afraid we might be found out by other people. Yeah, it's one thing to confess to God. It's a whole other level of things to, to let other people know, right? Yes, Nancy. Shame. Just playing out shame, feeling badly about ourselves. Who likes shame? Yes, Richard. Oh, well, that's deep too. Sometimes we think we've confessed our sin, but there's really something even deeper or greater going on that God needs to keep 
that pressure on us, that conviction, and help us to peel through those layers to get to. That's a good insight. Yes, Deontay. Oh, that's another good one. Our sin is so great that just one, one confession ain't going to be quite enough. You know? <laughs> that's, isn't that good, though? That's, that's true. Yeah, this is just so bad. I'm sure just, just dealing with this on one time is not going to be enough. And you know what I say to that, to me and to all of us, you guys? None of our sin is so bad that Jesus dying on the cross was not enough to pay the penalty for it. Once and for all right? We start to think, well, that, then we're saying that what Jesus did isn't enough. Or my sin's so bad compared to everybody else's, come on. But I understand. I understand what we're saying. David, then David prays here, make me to hear joy and gladness, because he's lost his joy and he's lost his gladness for a long time now. When we sin, we don't deal with it with God, we're going to lose our joy and our gladness. We might have some of that pseudo joy we talked about earlier from the world, but it ain't going to last. It's not true and it's only skin deep. And then he says here, the bones that you have broken may rejoice. God didn't literally break his bones. Again, he's speaking metaphorically, but it felt like there was this pressure on him, this pain that he was going through, which was the conviction of God at that point in time because he hadn't confessed yet. And he's saying, I just want to get over that and be relieved of that so I can, I can be healthy and rejoice and experience the joy again. Again, flipping back to Psalm 32, a psalm he wrote around the same time. David said, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. This is such a vivid description of the conviction that God will allow in our lives to bring us to repentance if we don't confess. David felt it. He described it wonderfully. So we see the cleansing, and then we kind of move into another set of verses that talks about change. Verse 10, I love this. Maybe you've heard this before. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. God can change people's hearts. God can change your heart. I talk to people all the time in counseling who don't believe that of their spouse. <laughs> He's never going to change. It's always been like this. That's not true. God changes people's hearts. Not just cleans them off or fix them up. He can radically change people's hearts. In like fact, he said in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I was talking about this with my wife just yesterday, and I mean, Lord knows I have not arrived. If you ever doubt that, just talk to my spouse, okay? She'll tell you. But I was saying to Deanne yesterday, you know, I feel like I'm kind of mellowing out a little bit. And her instant response was, yeah, that's a good thing, you know? <laughs> It's like, thank you, honey, for that encouragement. No. But, but, but what we're saying in, in a funny way was that I, think, I, I see God working in me. Maybe some of it's getting older, but I believe some of it's just God helping me mature a little bit, maybe learn a little more patience, a little more peace, a little more faith, you know? And that's encouraging to me. Can you look in your life and see maybe how God's working in you? I'm not saying you're, you've arrived. I'm not saying you're perfect. But can you look at your life and go, you know, I see how God's working in my life. Maybe how I've grown a little bit. I hope you can. Because he is. And that's encouraging. I mean, it's discouraging. Oh, I've got a long way to go. But it's encouraging that God's working. Making a little progress. Two steps forward, one step back. That's okay. That still ends up being one step forward, doesn't it not? <laughs> he can work in us and change us. He really can. And then David prays something here. Interesting. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. We need to talk about that because in the Old Testament, before Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when God poured out the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit indwelt 
believers. Before that happened in the Old Testament, God would place his spirit upon someone for a period of time, a certain person for a certain purpose. And we saw that like with King Saul. The Spirit of God came upon him for a while, but then Saul turned out to be such an evil king, we read that God removed his spirit from Saul. And that's what David saw. He was right there, right, going through it. And so David's afraid because of this sin that God is going to take his Holy Spirit away from him. We don't have to worry about that today. If you're a believer in Christ, the Holy Spirit came into you when you put your faith in Jesus in John 14, 16, Jesus said he will be with you forever. But even though we cannot lose the Holy Spirit, we also read very clearly in Scripture we can grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4, 30. We also read in 1 Thessalonians we can quench the work of the Spirit. And so even though our sin is never going to drive the Holy Spirit away from us, it can grieve him, it can affect him, Remember, he's a person, and it can inhibit what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives and through our lives because of our sin. We don't have to worry about, as David, that we're going to lose him forever. And then he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. He lost his joy, man. I mean, when you think about who we are and all that we have in Christ, we should be the happiest people on earth all the time. But when we have this sin, this crud on us that we haven't dealt with, it can just steal our joy right away. And the world is constantly working on doing that anyway. And the devil and our flesh. You remember the joy you had when you first came to Christ? I always think this is good to do once in a while. I've mentioned this before. Just to remember back to how you were when you first got saved, when God first opened your eyes, when you first received Jesus into your life and the Holy Spirit came in. I remember, man. And I want some of that back and I, I work on trying to, to keep that joy. I don't want to fake it, but just to remember, to appreciate the joy. But we, we'll lose it if we don't deal with our sin. We can't lose our salvation, but we can lose our joy. And then he says, uphold me by your generous spirit. The end of verse 12 there, generous spirit, God's generous Holy Spirit. You know, it's just a good reminder that you can't follow Jesus in your own strength. You can't do it. I'll bet a lot of you can do it a whole lot better than me, just in and of yourselves, but none of us can do it like we need to. We need the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a spiritual thing. The more we learn to surrender to the Holy Spirit working in us and let go of trying so hard, trying to figure it all out and being in control of everything and horsepowering it to happen, the better we're going to be able to abide in Christ. And David just talks about asking God to, to sustain him through his generous Holy Spirit. So when we truly confess and repent of our sin, God is merciful. His gracious forgiveness, it's unbelievable. He says he'll cleanse us, he'll restore us and change our hearts and restore that relationship with him. That's unbelievable. And the more we can grasp that, that moves us into our third point, the rejoicing the rejoicing. And as we read this last section, I just want you to, to notice the gratitude that we can and should have in our hearts. Look at verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. 
which we see moves into some rejoicing here. And, and the first thing we see is just that he, this proclaim, he's going to proclaim the goodness of God. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways. God, as you cleanse me, as you forgive me, as you restore me in relationship with you, I will proclaim the greatness of who you are and all you've done for me. Praise God, he forgives me of my sin. And he washes me clean of it. And he changes me from the inside out so we can have relationship again. I'm going to go tell people that who need to hear it. And then they will be saved. They'll be converted. They'll be changed. They'll be believers. You know, how can we go tell people about how great a relationship with God is through Jesus when we've got this unconfessed sin in our lives that's separating us from him? We can't. Not without being a real hypocrite about it. But when we allow God to do that cleansing and restoration, then we're free and motivated to do that. Sinners will be converted to you because we're all sinners. Everybody who ever lived is a sinner that needs to be saved. And the way that they're saved is by hearing the gospel, the truth about Jesus Christ. And the way they hear about that is for people who know the truth to tell them the truth. That's how it works. That's God's plan. That's Jesus' plan for building his kingdom. And in verses 14 and 15, we just see this praise you know, experiencing God's forgiveness and work in our lives should cause us to praise him. And he talks about with his tongue, he's going to sing aloud the righteousness of God. And with his mouth, he's going to show forth praise. Well, how can we sing and praise God when we're feeling so guilty? <laughs> That's when we want to withdraw, like we said earlier, and get our eyes focused on ourselves. But when we understand that God has forgiven us and cleansed us completely, we got something to sing and praise about, right? Because it's all about him and what he did for us and his grace and mercy. And then the last verses just talk about pleasing God. God is pleased when we get our hearts right with him. It says here, you do not desire sacrifice. Sacrifice good actions of themselves, religious rituals and habits, they mean nothing if our hearts are not right. Ritual without repentance will be rejected. A lot of alliteration tonight. You've got to love it. But what does God love? <laughs> it says in verse 17, you want to know what God loves? He loves someone that comes with a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Someone who realizes he's a sinner. He sinned against his holy God, his creator, and he's sorry. And he wants to be different. And he's humbly begging for mercy and forgiveness and cleansing. That's what God loves. This is why David is a man after God's own heart. It's not that he was perfect. Duh, it's obvious he wasn't. But because when he was convicted of his sin, he was broken and repentant to the one true God. He was reconciled to him. His faith never wavered. That's why he was a man after God's own heart. And God, it says God won't despise. God's not going to reject somebody who comes to him like that broken. Sometimes people feel like they have to have it all together before they can come to God or come to church or believe in Jesus. So I got, no, man, come to him. Just be real. And confess your sin and admit your need for him. That's the best way to come. It's really the only way to come. And then when your heart is, is right like that, then you can start to live a life that will please God as you do things in obedience to him, to bring him glory, to represent him well, to proclaim him to the world. Because you love him, now... It counts. Now it's pleasing to our Heavenly Father because their hearts are right. And I love how David, in verse 18, he's starting to take his eyes off of himself. He's starting to pray for his people. Do good to Zion. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He's thinking. It's the king, remember? He's starting to think about his people and God's holy city now. 
as he's understanding and receiving this cleansing and this forgiveness and this restoration, he can once again take his eyes off of himself. Did you know, just a side note, some of you might know sign language for the word sin is this. It's like pointing, just remember that. Me, 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 me. Sin, 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 sin. Anyway. And then it says, then God will be pleased. We can, we can live lives that are pleasing to God and worshipful when our hearts are right and clean, pure, and forgiven before him. So when we repent of our sins, in his mercy, in his unbelievable mercy and grace, God will forgive us and cleanse us and restore us. And as we experience that in our lives, we can know some of the rejoicing, some of that joy of our salvation. And we can live lives that are pleasing to God. You know, when you, when you go through this psalm and you look at some of the consequences of David's unconfessed, unrepentant sin, you see this unbelievable guilt, this, this feeling of he had of being separated from God. His spirit in him was churned up and disturbed. He'd lost his joy. He'd lost his praise. He'd lost his witness. It's a bad thing. Sin is bad. And we can confess it, but if we hold on to it and we don't, then there are consequences. And so, each of us needs to look at our own lives tonight. Two things. One, do you have unconfessed, unrepented sin in your life? Like David, are you hiding something or trying to sweep it under the rug and ignore it or kind of rationalizing that it's not bad or there or something? If you do, let me just tell you, it's killing you. It's killing you. And it's killing your relationship with God. And you need to confess it. As I said earlier, God already knows it. <laughs> but you need to confess it before him and repent of it and ask his forgiveness and then believe that he'll give it to you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to restore you. And then some of us, we, we, a lot of us raised our hands earlier, we're holding on to guilt and shame from things from the past that we've asked God to forgive us for, but it's still bringing us down and weighing on us. We've still got this crud on our souls. And, I mean, to quote a popular movie among my three-year-olds, we've got to let it go. Let it go, man. And it's okay to say, God, help me let this go. Sometimes the hardest person to forgive is ourselves. But if God can forgive us, who are we to not forgive ourselves? Come on. We're putting ourselves in the place of God, right? What Jesus did for us on that cross was enough. Always will be. And if our sin was terrible... His grace is even greater. That's why we rejoice. And, and just remember, it's not about us deserving forgiveness. It's just about God's unbelievable grace and mercy. That's what makes him so awesome. That's why we worship him. And that's why we give him all the praise and the glory and we spend time and sing songs, remembering who he is and what he's done for us. And that's why we got to go out and tell people the good news, right? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for inspiring. It's amazing. Thank you for using such a horrific thing, such, such sin in David's life, and using that for good in inspiring him to write this psalm that you've recorded in your word and preserved for us for thousands of years so that tonight, a little Camarillo in 2015, we can look at it, read it, study it, chew on it, and understand more about who you are and really tonight understand your unbelievable forgiveness. We just praise you for that. 
Lord, if there's anybody here tonight who's holding on to something they haven't confessed to you, I just pray for them. You'd give them the faith, the humility, the grace they need to get right with you. And for, for those of us, Lord, who still hold on to past guilt and shame, please, please set us free from that, Lord. Please strengthen our faith to, to believe what your word says, that you forgive us, we're white as snow. We're as pure as Jesus himself because of his sacrifice for us. Help us to do that. And I pray that as we experience that and understand that on deeper levels, Lord, we'd, we'd know a joy and that we could go out and just represent you to the world around us and proclaim the good news. Not only do you get heaven, but you get all your sins forgiven, man, and the guilt removed by believing in you. And we just recognize we need your spirit to work in us, God. And we just, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.